one thing you may not know about me is that I love bad movies. Like I take a special joy in a movie that is poorly written, poorly acted, poorly put together, and if you put Polly Shore in it, it's my favorite movie. <laughs> there haven't been movies that bad in a long time. The last one that I saw that was like that was in 2000, I think 2007, it was, uh, it was this movie. Paul Blart, <laughs> Mall Cop 2. So good they made a second one. <laughs> and like, like the movie is about a guy who's got a uniform that doesn't mean anything. His daughter won't listen to him. His coworkers don't respect him. And, and the people he's supposed to have authority to over don't listen to him. He is completely impotent and, in, and inept. Like he just, it is a, a bumbling comedy and I can't get enough of it. And I, I've just been thinking about authority this week as we, as we look at this, this particular passage in Mark. I started asking myself the question, is Jesus the ultimate authority in my life or is he the mall cop version of authority in my life? Right, the one whose, whose authority I'll just look at, but if I don't want to do it, I don't do it. Or is he the ultimate authority that what he says goes? And so what I want to do briefly in the next 20 minutes or so, I want to look at a story in the book of Mark uh, that, that highlights Jesus' authority and the reactions to his authority. And then I want to quickly just give us a challenge to respond to that authority. So to catch us up where we're at, in the book of Mark, it starts off with John the Baptist saying Jesus is coming. So John the Baptist shows up and he says, hey, Jesus is coming, repent. Then Jesus shows up, he gets baptized, and then he gets tempted in the wilderness, and then he goes and calls James and Peter and John and Andrew. They're fishing, doing their thing, and he says, hey, follow me. They drop everything their families, their livelihood, and they begin to follow Jesus, this rabbi, this teacher. Now, the very next thing that happens in the Gospel of Mark is this. This is the story of his first ministry foray in, in Capernaum, in Galilee. So what I want to do is, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's broken up into three different scenes, like a play. So I want to do a one scene here, one scene here, and then one scene here, and I want to kind of bring it all together with what it all means. So the first scene is, is this. It's a first two verses, it's a new authority. That's the first scene as Jesus kind of shows up. But I, because it's Family Worship Sunday, I want to add some motions to this, okay? So I want everyone to put their finger up, okay? okay. This is new. So the first scene is a new authority, all right? A new authority. Thank you, John Thie, finally. All right, and let, let me read Let me read the first two verses of this, and you'll, you'll get what we're getting at here. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered into the synagogue and was teaching. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. So where are we uh, kind of geographically? Let me give you a map of Israel. Uh, on your left is a large map of Israel. Jerusalem's kind of in the middle bottom there. And Capernaum is at the top of the Sea of Galilee. So uh, on your right, there's the smaller, uh, the smaller version of that. Capernaum's at the Sea of Galilee. If you want to know kind of how far we're talking about, the Capernaum and, and uh, Jerusalem, it's the same distance roughly as from this church to Polson. That's the, dis that's the distance we're talking about. And so it's not terribly far. And so Capernaum is a seaside city on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and let me show you what we've found so far. Uh, let me give you a kind of a, an old school map of Capernaum. So this is what Capernaum looked like at the time of Jesus. They've excavated. Archaeology has shown us this is kind of what the main, the main road in Capernaum looked like. Off to the far right is the Sea of Galilee. That big boxed-in, bold area, that's the synagogue. 
That's where, that's where all of this takes place in this particular area. Let me show you a picture of, the, of, of a synagogue that's actually built on this. So we just saw this in the Right Now Media, uh, the right now media video. Uh, Francis Chan is walking around in this synagogue. This synagogue is built a couple hundred years after Jesus was there. And it, it's of the same dimension, same style. And so this is exactly where Jesus would have been preaching. And so verse 21 says, and they went into Capernaum. They went into the, the city, the Sea of Galilee, went into the synagogue. Uh, it's they. Who's they? Peter, Andrew, James, John, Jesus. There's five of them right now. He doesn't have all 12 disciples. They go into uh, the synagogue and he begins teaching, which is a relatively normal thing. That in a synagogue on Sabbath, they would often invite really, really learned or smart teachers to come teach. And so it wouldn't be uncommon for someone to walk in on, on Sabbath and begin expounding on the scriptures. And so Jesus walks in there uh, and, and begins teaching. And the scribes who are in charge of the synagogue, the scribes are like the lawyers or the, or the experts on the Mosaic law. They're the ones who usually kind of run the synagogue. They begin to listen to him teach begin to listen to him uh, exposit and explain the scriptures, and, and, and they're shocked because he's doing something that no other teacher has ever done. He's walking into the synagogue, reading the Old Testament, and, and what scribes would do is they would read the Old Testament and say, well, and this rabbi says this, and this rabbi says this, and this rabbi says this, and I agree with them. Jesus didn't say that. He stood on his own authority. He began preaching and explaining the text on his authority. He didn't say, and Hillel said, and Gamaliel said, and all these things. He said, I say this is what it means, and it shocked everyone who was there. One of my, uh, one of my favorite things in grade school when I was a kid in high school and in college, actually any time I was in school, was when there was a substitute. Because the sub would walk in, and you knew the substitute didn't have their own, uh, their own lesson plan. They were working off someone else's lesson plan, and if they could decipher it, that was great. But if not, what ended up more, more than likely happening with a substitute, you watched a movie all day, or played heads up, seven up, or whatever, whatever the game was, it was, if you had a sub, it was all day recess, and you knew they had no authority. They couldn't do anything. The scribes, get this, the scribes didn't realize it, but they were the substitute teachers about to meet the real teacher. That's the interplay here. That they, they for so long have been, have been teaching something that they don't have the authority for, and the real teacher shows up, and it blows their minds. Verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority. This word astonished, it sounds like a positive thing, like they're really excited about it, but that's not what this word means. Uh, it, you know, if you, if you take your eyebrows, everyone, if you take your eyebrows, kind of furrow them like this, and go, huh? Everyone do that. Huh? That's astonished. That's what this, it's, it's, what is going on here? This is, I don't know if it's positive, I don't know if it's negative, but it's so different than anything I've ever seen. Calvin and the Hobbes, the great theologians. Uh, Susie and Calvin are talking. Calvin says, Susie, who, where's Miss Wormwood? Who's, that, who's this lady at her desk? Miss Wormwood's sick. That's our substitute teacher. Calvin says a substitute. And then he demands to see the teaching certificate. His face, that kind of, that's what we're talking about. That's the scribes looking at Jesus saying, wait a second. Where's your authority? He's teaching as someone who, where's his authority? Where's his degree? This is completely shocking. So we've got, the first scene is Jesus going up, and it's a new all right, everyone do it with me. I'll, come on. A new authority. Perfect. Scene two is this. You've got a new authority, but we've got the same old, give me, your, give me a muscle, the same old opposition, but a new result. Okay? Same old opposition, new result. So we've got Perfect. Verse 23. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. An unclean spirit 
is a Jewish phrase for what we understand to be a demon. A demon is, a, uh, is a, uh, a spirit who is ordered around by Satan, who is controlled by Satan. And, and demons harass, oppress, and can oppress people. If you are a Christian, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the grave, you cannot be possessed by a demon. Because a demon would have to be stronger than the triune God, and that's not a thing. So a Christian cannot be possessed, but a Christian can be op- oppressed. And a Christian can be harassed. That's kind of what we're dealing with here. And so in this, in this particular story, this unclean spirit represents the kingdom of darkness. He represents all evil. And so it's, he's not just, this demon is not just representing himself. As we'll see, he's representing all of the evil. This is really the first battle between good and evil in the book of Mark. Jesus has been baptized, he's done the the temptation, he's got his disciples. Now he's doing his ministry and he's being confronted by evil. Verse, here's what the demon says. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, if, you, if, you, if you've done your Bible reading and you're doing your observation, something's really interesting here. There's one demon-possessed man. There's one unclean spirit. But he keeps saying the word us. It's third-person plural. What have you to do with us? There's only one person in the story. Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? And then he goes into the first person, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. This demon, this unclean spirit, is really saying, have you come to destroy me and my compatriots? Have you come to destroy all of evil? Have you come to destroy us, the kingdom of darkness? And then he goes into the first person and says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Holy One of God. In other words, the demon has for the very first time encountered the real teacher. He's no longer playing around with substitute teachers. The scribes and their fake mall cop, whatever. He's encountered the real living God. And his first question is self-preservation. Have you come to destroy us? Is our time done? He has met real power. Jesus says, verse 25, but he rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. Jesus, uh, what I love about this is, is in this interaction, Jesus doesn't have a special incantation where he has to repeat a bunch of things a bunch of times. He doesn't, he doesn't go and get his special holy water or holy oil and sprinkle it on him and then do some prayer. He doesn't say, hey, let's sit for 30 minutes and we'll, we'll kind of work through this. He says, be silent and be gone. Now, Jesus just spoke, and things happened. It's just like at the very beginning of Genesis where it says, and God said, let there be light. That The parallel that Mark is drawing is, is this is the one who created everything, and because he's created everything, he's got the authority and the power to say these things, and not only to say these things, but that they are done immediately. The demon, notice what's, what's not present in the text, the demon doesn't go, well, 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 well I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to go. I've got some tormenting I want to do. Can I stick around for another week? That he's met the Holy One of God. And he says, be quiet and leave him. Jesus has complete authority. The demon can't argue, cannot resist, and cannot delay. This new authority, whatever it is, whatever's happening with Jesus, this new authority, it can't be ignored. That the demon recognizes and confesses that's Jesus. Now that confession is not one of belief. It's not one of faith. It is confession of fact that that the demon knows that he is the son of God. And that if he's the son of God, that he has authority, which means the son of God has authority over the demonic realm. That he can shout to a demon and the demons have to crumble. And, And what we know from Colossians is that even Satan is on a leash. That Jesus is Lord of everything, Lord of everyone, Lord of every spirit. Jesus backed up his teaching with this miracle. So I'm going to stop just briefly and ask ourselves the question, what do we think is going to happen next? Because remember, Jesus and the disciples have, have just walked in to the synagogue. He's got this new teaching, teaching with authority, He's just cast out this demon. Scribes, these lawyers had no chance of ever doing that. Surely the response will be faith. Let's see. 
So we've got a, a new... Perfect. We've got the same old opposition, a new result. He's cast out. And finally over here, we have a shocking response. Huh? Give it to me. Huh? Perfect. We've got a new authority, the same old opposition, and then a shocking response. What? Verses 27 through 28. Uh, real quick, before I read them, I want to recap where we're at. I want to make sure we understand the flow of the text. Jesus has gone to the synagogue. He's preached. They're astonished. The demon comes. He casts him out. And, and here we go. Here's the response of everyone else there. Verse 27. And they were all amazed. So far, so good. So that they questioned among themselves, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once, his fame spread everywhere throughout this, all the surrounding region of Galilee. Oh, they begin to talk amongst themselves. We've never seen this before. The, this guy speaks with authority, and he backs it up. A couple things to notice here. A couple things to note. Number one, this is important for the book of Mark, and this is important for faith. The people who, who saw Jesus do this miracle do not regard the miracle as important as the message. That when they're, when they're viewing this process, when they're viewing this demon being cast out, the most important thing is not the miracle, it's the message. Verse, uh, verse 27 says this. What is this? A new teaching with authority. They are mostly concerned with the proclamation of the truth that Jesus has brought. And they're more concerned with it because, well, he was a man with authority. And then he showed his authority that the miracle was meant to point back to the message Church, we need to understand that. That through the book of Mark and through all the Gospels, we see Israel and we see many people see Jesus do miraculous things. And they want to see more and more miraculous things. And Jesus continues to point them back to the fact that Jesus did not come to make you healthy. He did not come to cast out demons. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to proclaim the Gospel. And everything he did was aimed at heightening that message. So, so one thing to understand is that they were focused on the message. The second thing to, to note here is that, that none of them really come to faith, right? Like it doesn't say there was a big revival in Capernaum and, and everyone leapt for joy and believed. They had questions and, and, and they didn't know what to do. There was, this, there was this, who is this guy? Most of us think, hey, most of us think if Jesus just showed up and I saw him do a miracle, my faith would be greater. It's just if we were just standing in line at, at Big Dipper and someone broke their leg, and Jesus shows up, and whew, that's the sound for miracles. Shoo. As if all of a sudden we would see that, and our faith would be strengthened. But what we know is that there were multitudes of people who saw Jesus do miracles, and it was never enough, because it's always been about faith. That seeing does not equal believing. Believing requires trust in who Jesus is. Trust in what he says to repent and believe in the gospel. That, that we can have forgiveness for our sins. We can have hope. We can have a different life only through Jesus. It takes belief and trust. No amount of miracles is going to change our hearts. Our main point this morning as we kind of wind down is this. Real authority requires a response. That if Jesus is who he says he is, if Jesus is uh, what this, this passage shows us, he is not just a teacher, but he's a teacher with authority over the whole demonic realm. And that he is the authority from, a, from the old ages, from, from creation. If that's true, then it requires a response. It means we must at least reckon with the fact that Jesus does not portray himself to be a substitute teacher. Just another guy. He does not portray himself to be uh, just a mall cop or, or the morality police trying to reign in your life. That Jesus came as the Son of God. And if that's true, then that requires a response from us. It means that the only way we can find forgiveness, the only way we can find peace, the only, the only way we can be united with God is through Jesus, through his death and resurrection. It also means that for those of us who have come to faith, it means that we need to continually fight this in our hearts, the, the mall cop Jesus, who we get to argue with, who when he says you can do something, we want to vote for it. Jesus came speaking in authority. 
He's the creator of the universe and the savior of our souls. So look, we can give our past to him. We can give our present to him. We can give our future to him. And in that, we will be forgiven and changed. This is, this is the beauty of, of, of what this miracle shows. It shows that he is powerful enough to say, if you repent and believe in the gospel, if, if you, he is powerful enough to say that and then follow through on it. That Jesus can talk the talk, and because he's the authority, he can walk the walk. So don't delay obedience today to Jesus. Some of us have delayed obedience because it'll be too hard, it'll cost too much, or the unknowns of the future we can't trust Jesus with. But look, if Jesus has authority over evil, and if he has authority to save, then the best thing we could do is to follow him today and to follow him without delay. Let's pray. God, we are grateful that you have given us your son. That the good news of the gospel is that we are broken, we are helpless, we are separated without Jesus. And the gospel says that Jesus comes to save, comes to change and to transform. He comes to preach the good news and to transform hearts. He is a man with unparalleled authority and power because he is also God. And so God, I ask that you would uh, change the hearts of our young people. God, this next generation would come to love and appreciate God. And they would see parents and grandparents following the authority, loving the authority of Jesus in their life. Oh God, that you would make me, that you would make us a people who cherish the authority of Jesus in our lives. All he's ever done has brought goodness and life to us. Oh God, that we would cherish and love his authority. We ask that you would do these things in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen.